כלל ל... לעברית שלי, ש... He discovered it too soon. I was about to trick him to speak Hebrew. No, no, no I'm kidding. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you very much to Andy Bickelbaum for being our guest at the Artist Studios. And just a few quick things. I want to thank the Art Cube Artist Studios, all the team for working really hard, Lee, the director, the Jerusalem Foundation for making it possible, Cinefield, the production company, for being really good partners. And the Jerusalem Foundation, the, um, sorry, the Jerusalem Cinematheque for hosting us here, of course. Um, and um, I'll start with some warm-up questions. Um, so I want to start with something else, but then I thought that the ending was really nice in the sense that the action that you ended the film with was an action that was symbolic in the sense that people actually want to be good. Yeah. So you didn't, didn't really expect that people will respond that way, but, you, but then you realize that it's possible. So maybe yeah. you can talk about this. Well, we kind of expected they would react that way. They would do the rain dance and everything? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, we I weren't didn't. sure. Yeah, no, I know. It's, it's not what you <laughs> would expect. But, you know, part of it is the authority um, of the Native American chief. You know, um, or the guilt. And the guilt around that. Um, exactly. Um, and part of it's authentically, I think that, yeah, why not? You know, the government decides we're going to do the right thing. We're going to make some money. Everybody's going to be okay. Nobody's, you know, going to end up dead. Let's, let's do it. And so, you know, authentically, I think they, they were excited at a, a rational approach to this thing that they knew was a problem even if they don't like to face that very much. Yeah, and it made them feel that they were actually doing a good thing, which is probably doesn't happen to them often. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somewhere in their heads they know they're, they're, that things are not right and maybe their work is not quite what it should be, but they just go along because, you know, a paycheck is pretty exciting to have every month. <laughs> so they just do it, but you know, you give people an opportunity to be good, and yeah, and and to resolve those deep, problematic issues that they have with what they're doing. And, yeah, like and a tikkun of a certain trauma. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And how would you how would you define a good activist action? <coughs> like, what should it entail to actually be successful? I don't know. It depends on the context. Like. Um, you know, for that action, I mean, it, it didn't cause energy uh, policy to change in the U.S., and we didn't really expect it to, but we needed an end for the movie. It was uplifting and exciting, so it was a good action because it gave us that. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's not usually the case. Usually we, we try to really be very precise about what we're doing. Like with the, the first one, the Chamber of Commerce one, um, that was a moment when a lot of people were thinking the same way. There was this moment when people um, were uh, upset at the Chamber of Commerce for this thing, and they were opposing climate change legislation. And th there was an opportunity to do something around that. And there was already a movement around it. There were lots of people fighting against it, seeing the problem. Um, lots of people not seeing the problem, but enough people seeing the problem that it was possible to get on top of that you know, join that wave and be a little part of it. So it looks like we had something to do with the chamber reversing its position, but actually it was many, many, many groups and individuals doing something. And that's usually like our actions. When, when they're successful, they add a little bit of something to the culture that then result, helps a little bit, maybe, but who knows, it's not science. You can't tell if it helps or not. Sometimes it might just be seeding an idea. Like with that last action, I think it's seeding this idea so that people start thinking, oh yeah, we could totally have energy revolution in the US. Why not? We could fix climate change totally. And we could, you know, I mean, maybe not fix it, but we could stop making it worse. And um, I mean, there are a lot of people thinking that, but it's a very small minority that really think we could do that by 2030 or whatever the date was there within 30 years. So it's really getting that idea out there so that if one day there is a chance, what the political circumstance where we could do that, then people have that idea in their heads and can do it. Yeah. Um, before, we were talking before, and we were talking about the, the local situation. 
And you mentioned that there's a difference between the method and the vision. Can you maybe talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the occupation, like the resolution to the occupation, obviously, right now is not going to happen. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that could happen. I mean, you could get to a play. I, I, yeah, where to start? <laughs> That's the problem, where to start? <laughs> where to start? Well, you start with the vision. You start with the ideal. Like, there is a utopian solution. It's not hard to see if you don't live here. Um, <laughs> it, it seems pretty simple, like, what could happen and how good it could be. Um, and it would be amazing if, like, I mean, not that, you know, as soon as I say one word about what I think, it's going to be like, oh, but that can't happen for this reason or that reason or that other reason. And so what? You know, you have to start with the utopian vision to inspire people and and then people it, it happens you know people figure it out eventually like there's a lot of utopian things that have happened in the last 30 years like gay marriage in the US completely radically unthinkable um, you know Podemos the Occupy movement may be poised to take power in Spain completely unthinkable to Spanish activists I've talked to them even the even the ones at the core of it just never imagined that could ever happen so um, really starting with this utopian vision, and then things happen, I don't know. And the methods are just, you know, well, get people thinking about things a certain way, make people a little less afraid, figure out ways to reduce fear um, around the situation, and you get to this place that's different, eventually. And you don't think of like step one, step two, step three, you think of like, where do we want to go? How can we sell that vision? And then you sell it over the years. Yeah. That sounds perfect. That'd be more fun. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have specific ideas no, about made, that, but... It that, made sense, okay. I think. Um, no, it did. Uh, so different regimes uh, respond differently to activism and protest. You, you, we could see in the film that in Russia there is a lot of violence sometimes from police. They're like really hardcore. and. We saw in Gezi Park, people from the social protest here were looking at people at Gezi Park and saying, wow, that's really like, they're really getting shot. Um, and here, I think recently, there's um, increasing censorship, also a lot in the art and culture. Sometimes um, funding is being cut or things are not being shown without even seeing them just because they raise some sort of debate. So um, what advice do you have to activists? How can they deal with it in different situations? How can they bypass that and not be afraid of that, not self-censor themselves? <laughs> right. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I think it's a matter of just not, not being afraid. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, realizing that eventually we win and, you know, we broadly, um, like even Gezi Park, you know, they're very depressed in Turkey about that. They were very depressed until recently. Um, but then the, the Kurdish party did really well in the last election, as you know, and I think everybody here knows. We don't know this, these kind of things in America, unless we <laughs> look into it. Um, but, you know, that was a surprise. And they've adopted the Gezi ideas. And so, you know, they were very depressed because it seemed to be failing and there was all this repression. How do we possibly fight back against it? But the ideas were out there and a lot, you know, immensely well-known, these ideas, and it got into politics. So you don't know how these things get out there. So I think the key is just like, fuck it, if they're gonna, you know, what, what are they gonna do, really? Like, it's not like they're gonna come in and, and shoot a lot of people. Probably um, <laughs> not like not at this point. Not 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 yet. Um, so you know you just have a certain kind of faith that that putting things out there and, and doing things and getting word the word out there um, eventually results in some kind of change and you don't know how exactly. I think. Yeah. Should we take some questions from the audience? Sure. I know you have questions. Is there any that train not to ask questions? <laughs> Isn't there the like? Yeah. Isn't there like the two Jews, three opinions? Or <laughs> Don't be shy. Um, I've always seen your work in the context of art, and I'm wondering how that is, and what's your, what's your relationship? 
the question was how um, you, you've all seen our work in the context of art, and yeah. or you've 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 thought of it as art. Um, I've never th we've never thought of it as art, really. I mean, in a way, we don't care. Um, uh, you know, if people want to think of it as art, I guess that's okay. But in the U.S., art is a safe space where you know if it's art, it's okay. You can be critical and. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, nice little artist. Uh, say what you want. I, I think that's different in Europe. Um, <laughs> and it's probably different here, I assume. Um, here it can be seen as a threat. Um, when speaking in Europe, I, I say Europeans don't like have a respect for art because you know they denied admission to an art school to this young artist and he became <laughs> you know, what. Um, so art, art, but art has a lot of power, I guess. But yeah, I, mean, I, I avoid the term. And I, I mean, part of it is we don't care who thinks what of it in the art context. It's not meant for an art context, which is a very small, segment even at best of the you know and our work has to be seen by a lot of people to be to mean anything and that's the whole point and you know that's why we make movies um i mean we do these media actions trying to get media but we found that people don't really remember those so we document and then tie it together into a bigger thing that maybe has a different kind of effect but um the art Art doesn't really enter into that. The like presenting things in an art context doesn't really make much sense for us. In Israel, imposing as something for someone is illegal. And in the beginning, I said in Israel, imposing as something is illegal. Oh yeah, it's in, it's illegal everywhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning of your film, you show there was a lawsuit, and they didn't show what happened with this lawsuit. We, we did, in the credits. Yes, but, but what really happened, and how do you deal with this legal... Or you don't believe it? <laughs> <laughs> they, they dropped the lawsuit after four years. And they stopped suing you? They, yeah. How so come? you get a freedom how come? of... Okay, so what happened was they, uh, they sued us, and it's the first time in 20 years of doing this that anybody has ever sued us. And it doesn't mean that impersonating people is illegal. It is, it is if, if the person is real. And I'm sure it's the same in Israel. You can invent a fake identity and be that identity and say that you're from, you know, the whatever department. And that's, as long as it's not a real person, you're adopting the, you know, you're not pretending to be somebody real. I think, I think it's legal. But um, I think it's legal in the U.S. too. I'm not sure. But the main the main thing is, anyways, like to take a tangent, you can do illegal things, but and you're not going to get in trouble if getting you in trouble is going to be embarrassing to the target. Like you know, any of our targets over the last 20 years could have sued us or attacked us in various ways. And they they used to at the beginning. They used to send these legal threats which we would then send to many journalists and um, amuse a lot of people. Um, and that would get press and that would get negative attention for the target. So they, they, didn't, they stopped doing that after a while. And we've never gotten any kind of meaningful like attack ever except for that. And I think they did, it was just personal. Like they, they're really, they don't care about public opinion. They're a big lobbying organization. They don't have they don't care what people think of them. Um, so you have to calculate that, not so much like is it illegal or not, but can you, if they attack you, can you make fun of them for that? Can you s make people laugh at the situation? It's like a David and Goliath story, you know? David is always gonna win. Um, so, you know, Goliath might as well, you, you can invite Goliath to attack you, as long as you can make it look like a David and Goliath story. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that's what, that didn't answer the question, which was the lawsuit, and they dropped it. <laughs> as a, an American Jew, are you ever ashamed of Israel's action as a state? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm here, actually. Um, <laughs> 
be the last film, you know, our last film was invited to the Jerusalem Film Festival and we boycotted, and this time too, but I didn't want, I, I wanted to come, so this was arranged kind of outside of the festival so it can't be used as part of the, you know, it's, it's not government funded, so it squeaked in, kind of trying to still boycott, sort of. <laughs> Some of your actions, I guess, you know, cost a lot of a lot of money, and I guess the sue you get, you know, four years of, of doing that is yeah. cost a lot of money, and they didn't break you for that. So if you can say something about how you found uh, the, the founding of your actions and, uh, mm -hmm. and if you have a kind of an umbrella or something to take care of you if somebody like Shell is you know, going after you. Yeah, so the, quest you return yeah. the question. Yeah, the question is um, how do we fund these actions which are very expensive looking and um, what about when we were sued for four years we had to defend ourselves, and that must have been expensive. Um, the, 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 the lawsuit we w would have been expensive if we had had to defend ourselves, mm -hmm. but we were defended by an organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which as soon as they sued us, they, they defend in those cases. And um, abroad, they, they put activists in touch with whatever organization locally is handling that sort of thing, defending <laughs> you. So, I don't know what the situation is here, but there, I'm sure you'd get pro bono legal help. If you did something like this and you were attacked and it was seen as a case that was important or could be important or could be politically important, um, some lawyer would, or legal group would probably step up and defend you um, the way they did us. And there's different, I mean, we've gotten various offers of pro bono legal help over the years, so that, they just were the right organization for that. And they put us together with a large law firm uh, called Davis Wright Tremaine, which has a lot of legal muscle, and they defended us. And it was all pro bono. Um, and ultimately unnecessary, since the chamber dropped the suit. But it would have been a real um, lawsuit with a lot of legal help. So the other question was, oh, and the actions. Um, some of them are expensive, but the ones that we do ourselves are not. Like, we, we don't pay much. New York Times, at the end of the last movie, we said there were four million copies. It was like 80,000 copies, and that only cost like $10,000, which was funded by a, 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 mostly by an individual and some crowdsourcing, like Kickstarter. So they're not expensive. The movie part is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm not only... Oh, okay, <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I got that. Can you repeat the question? I'll repeat it. Um, so in this movie, we're dealing with a, an issue that has some kind of consensus, like climate change. Everybody kind of thinks it's a bad thing, which, by the way, is not true. In the US, it's like 50% of the population. But <coughs> you know, it's pretty obvious. Um, and how would you deal with a situation where there's less consensus? Like, for example, the occupation of the West Bank. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't mean that, but... <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I mean differently, I guess. I was, I was thinking of that as I was watching the last few minutes of the film. Like, oh yeah, this isn't quite like this situation. It's not, you know, probably if you announced something great, some big utopian vision around the occupied territories in Israel to a room full of, you know, <laughs> Shin Bet members. I don't know what. <laughs> um, it wouldn't go over quite as well. I think they would see a, poke a lot of holes in it. How um, members do you think we have? But I think you, you just approach it differently. You know, this is not something where that kind of decision, you know, some, some like, the, this is a long term thing here. It's like maybe there's a few people in this room thinking 
of a different world and really imagining it and being able to see it. Um, and, you know, that's a start. So you, you start putting that out there and figuring out ways to communicate that and get people thinking in these terms rather than the old terms that aren't really bad and that don't work for anybody. And then, you know, 10 years, maybe things are a little different and some of those ideas can start getting more powerful. I mean, that's how change happens, I think. Um, but it's supposed to be that way. I think it is that way. Well, I mean, it stops and starts, you know, but slavery in the US was completely natural at one point and unthinkable to change. And, you know, that, like, that was the dominant idea. They had the same arguments about slavery that people have about oil companies now, that you, you can't just stop it. It would ruin, it destroy the economy. And bit by bit, over a long period of time, attitudes were changed and, you know, relentlessly, and new language was come up with around it that eventually got out. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that happens too. Yeah. I mean, you just have to assume that eventually things will get better. I mean, maybe you need some new approaches or, you know, new ideas. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll do my best in the next two weeks. You're fighting climate change. Why are you still eating meat? That's a good question. Um, because uh, I'm eating less meat, um, but it, I mean, there's no really great answer to that, except that change is not, you know, I shouldn't eat meat. I really shouldn't. I also, you know, honestly, I mean, there's a lot of things I shouldn't do. I shouldn't fly in airplanes. I shouldn't um, ever ride in a car. I shouldn't, there's a million things I shouldn't do. Probably these clothes are made in Bangladesh under horrible conditions. I mean, uh, it's really hard as a member of a society that's profoundly unjust to always be doing the right thing. It's almost impossible. Eating meat is an easy thing to fit, to change. Like, I, I, probably, I should stop eating meat. But, <laughs> but everything else, you know, is also bad. Like, and where you can actually make the most change as a person is as a citizen, like really, you know, th by making um, legislative change, by force, by pushing for actual policy change, and you know, our choices as consumers, our power as consumer, is really tiny um, compared to our power as citizens. We can't really make much of a difference as consumers within a system that's unjust. We actually have to change the rules of the game. And I think like, for example, in the US at least, a lot of people would be willing to pay higher taxes for a good, if, if everybody else were doing it, to um, uh, really make a difference around climate change, let's say. But very few people are really gonna stop flying and stop um, driving and stop eating meat and making all these sacrifices in their personal lifestyle when who else is gonna be doing that? Like, if I stop flying anywhere, is that really gonna change a lot of things? I mean, maybe if I can use my personal action as part of a statement, as part of a political action, but it, in itself, it's not gonna make any difference whatsoever, unless I use it as part of something that is about changing policy. Um, do you um, have any... Um um, proposals for dealing with the U.S. national gun um, lobby situation. No. Can you <laughs> oh, do I have any proposals for dealing with the national gun lobby situation in the U.S.? No. I mean, I think uh, somebody I know is doing an action around that. Um, but yeah, there's so many things. We we launched that thing at the end of the film, the action switchboard. You see this website so that people who want to do something like you around the national gun lobby in the US, although I'm not sure why you would want to do something about that here when there are some far more pressing things to deal with. 
Um, but if you did, you could go to the action switchboard and you know suggest an idea or look for an idea around that and join in and get advice on carrying it out. Also, by the way, if anybody comes up with ideas um, related to the occupation, which is what I'm interested in personally, um, you know, go, go to the action switchboard and propose your idea and you'll get help um, refining it or, you know, brainstorming it or whatever and you'll be put in touch with people to work with. With the pro bono lawyer? <laughs> I, yeah, that part, I don't know. I, mean, I, I really think that's a whole other subject. We have um, some documents on the website too that explain what, how to be afraid of the law and how not to be afraid of the law. So if you want to read that on that same website. I have other members. I wanted to ask you something more concrete about your method of working and your way of thinking. When you're working on your actions, for example, if, when you write the text to your speeches, when you're working on the presentations, when you're planning the details of the action, how do you balance, because it always seems like it almost goes to the point of absurd, but it's still reliable and then it's, so it has its impact. So how do you balance between absurdity? How do you decide when it's too fun? How do you know how to create this impact? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. You just, I mean, there's, you just, yeah, you try to come off as real, like if you're faking, you're, you're talking about when we like stand up and pretend to be somebody we're not, how do we come off as realistic enough. I mean, you just listen to yourself, give the talk, and you go, well, no, that word is too much. You know, I can get away with that word or that phrase, but that other phrase is too much. And you just figure it out. I mean, it has to be, it has to be weird enough that afterwards when people know that it's a joke, that it was fake, that they, they think about those things and they laugh about those things. Like in that Chamber of Commerce speech, there were a lot of really strange phrases and jokes and all kinds of stuff that nobody heard the first time because they weren't expecting it to be a joke, but then when you listen to it again, it's, it's funny. So you just think in, in those terms, like, okay, it has to not, not just be funny, but be poignant and get the point across, but it can't set people off. So sometimes you use phrases that the opponent uses. You, you sound like the opponent. You sound like people that you don't want, that, you're attacking or that you're trying to um, oppose. So in the Chamber of Commerce speech, you know, it's all about business, this, business, that. You know, it's easy also to see a solution, and if that solution could ever, even in 20 years, be arrived at, it would change the entire world and perception of what can be done and how good things can be and so on. So, you know. <laughs> so that's what we were chosen for. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so why not just recast it as that? Okay, chosen to fix the world that way, you know? It's like, it can be a progressive vision too. I think taking those things, instead of like just rejecting them, but just instead like really taking them and, and reusing them, owning them, I think is more, more interesting, more powerful. So on that note, uh, what's more, another question? Uh, just one more. If you can elaborate a bit more about the use of humor as an activist uh, strategy. Uh, humor as an activist strategy? Yeah, it's um, it's. Why do you think it's a benefit well, of using humor opposed to? Because people like to laugh, and I mean, it's not just humor. It's also like messing with things and, and you know changing things in different ways and getting things across in a way that you don't expect. So I think it's just, you can get across ideas that you can't get across just by yelling, or by writing serious things, or by, you know, going head on. You can kind of go around the corner, and if you can make a joke, you can get people laughing about something. You can get some ideas across in that way. Um, last question. It better be good, Oz. <laughs> no pressure, though. <laughs> you know, they, they generally, they won't buy it. Yeah. Well, that shell action, I mean, a little secret is that, you know, like nothing actually came out of the actual press conference. Like, they, that wasn't... We, we planted a guy with a cell phone 
pretending to be an Occupy, well, actually he was an Occupy activist, <laughs> and, oh yeah, the, that happened before Occupy in the film, right? It actually happened after Occupy in reality, <laughs> and he was in the film, in the uh, audience of the shell action with a camera pretending to, to film it and find this thing happening, and um, he leaked it, um, pretending like it was a real thing, and it spread like wildfire because it looked like Shell had made this big mistake, and there was a website associated with it. So it didn't actually depend on the actual event. It depended on the filming of the event, the documentation, and getting that out there in this kind of clever way through the Occupy networks. And, um, and so you, you don't, you know, you think of how it's perceived in the media and how it gets out there via, well, the media or social media and you worry less about like, is are people in the audience gonna believe it? Even the chamber action, there were a couple of reporters, there were maybe five or six reporters in the audience, there were also some fake reporters. Um, and the way that got out there um, was through a press release that we sent out. So that's how Fox News found out. It wasn't the reporter in the audience sending it to the, you know, it looks like that, but actually we sent out a press release also. So it's really more about that. Yeah, the documentation. Thank you very much, Andy.